Please join us in singing the hymn uh, in response to this reading. A reading from Psalm 16. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Welcome to Talbot Park on this Pentecost Sunday and our 78th anniversary that we are celebrating today as well. We are glad to see such a good group of folks here. Uh, I like to make a big deal about Pentecost. Pentecost is the third holiest day on the Christian calendar. Growing up in my Baptist church, you would never have known it. It was Easter, Mother's Day, and Fourth of July. Those were the high holy days of the Baptist church of my childhood. Uh, but Pentecost is a big deal. This is when we celebrate the birth of the church, and it happens to coincide with the celebration of the birth of our own congregation, Talbot Park, and we're celebrating that today, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Glad for all of you who have joined us in person, as well as those who continue to join us virtually. And just so you know, questions about the mask as people have come in, uh, we have tried to get the word out. If you have been fully vaccinated, we are no longer requiring you to wear the mask. If you have not, we are asking that you continue to do so. If you prefer to do so for any other reason, by all means, please do if that makes you more comfortable. Uh, it's up to you, but that is uh, our policy going forward and we wanna make sure everybody is aware of that. So let's stand as we continue in this time of worship together and sing Pentecostal power.
may be seated. Let's pray together. God of Pentecost, on this day, we remember the gifts that come to us from heaven. We are thankful this Sunday morning to be loved by the God of the universe. And as we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit, we are thankful for the group of believers known as Talbot Park Baptist Church. Today we remember men and women who had a vision of what could be and who worked hard to make it possible. All of us here this morning are a part of that legacy and we are grateful for the courage and the patience of those who came before us. We thank you for pastors and Sunday school teachers and youth leaders and deacons and countless others who encouraged us along the way. And we thank you for the way our church continues to grow. We thank you for the quirky and unique characters in our midst. And we admit sometimes we get along better than we do with others, but inside us we have a commitment to making this church, this people, a Christ-centered body of believers. Lord, we ask for forgiveness when we allow those differences to divide us. And we pray that we will bear fruit as we serve in your name. Spirit of comfort, we remember today those in our church family who are not physically present, some who are far away, some who are sick and recovering from procedures, and we ask for healing and relief from pain for those who continue to suffer. We also remember this morning those who are mourning the loss of loved ones May the Holy Spirit bring peace and a sense of God's presence when that loss is overwhelming. God, as we gather here, we pray that the unity of Pentecost will continue to spread. Help us to be agents for change so that through the power of the Spirit, we will break down the barriers that exist in our world between people of different countries and backgrounds. Give us a sense of your Spirit moving in our lives, that we may reach out to others in your name. And with all the saints who have gone before us, we pray, come Holy Spirit, come. Amen.
most beautiful Amos and Ellie. Thank you. Everyone is invited to join in singing our next praise song, See You Again. You'll recognize this. We've sung it before. Stand up. <laughs> oh, stand up. <laughs> I'm going to be reading from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, we were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated them and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. They were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under earth were there as well. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, 
Amphilia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Serene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts from Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? text this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 17, and I'll begin reading in verse 6. Jesus said, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them. And they have received them, 
and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. The word of God for the people of God. John chapter 17 is part of a much longer section of this gospel that scholars refer to as the farewell discourse. And they call it that for fairly obvious reasons. The farewell discourse is the speech that Jesus gives to his disciples before he goes to the cross. Calling it the farewell discourse makes it sound very formal. Really, this is a conversation between friends. The setting is the upper room following the Passover meal that Jesus and his disciples have shared together. And this is really Jesus' way of saying goodbye to his friends. This is his opportunity to kind of sum up all the advice, all the teaching and preaching that they have shared over the course of their ministry together, at the end of which Jesus offers a prayer. Uh, and there's nothing too unusual about that. Jesus often prays in the Gospels, but... What makes this prayer in John chapter 17 so unique is that this is the only time in the Bible when Jesus specifically prays for his followers. And by his followers, I'm not just talking about the 12 or at this point in the story, the 11 disciples who were there in the room with him. I'm talking about all of us. Here in this prayer, Jesus is praying for all who are his and all to whom he has made known his name. I find that to be pretty incredible. <laughs> uh, remember, this is the climax of the gospel story. Jesus is about to go to the cross, but even in those fateful moments, even as Jesus is fully aware of the pain and suffering he's about to endure, he is thinking about us. I find that to be comforting that even as his own life is threatened, Jesus loves and cares enough about us to pray on our behalf. I think sometimes you and I undervalue that. You and I tend to focus on the results of prayer and not so much on the reassurance that prayer can bring others. And I think that's because a lot of the time you and I think of prayer as something essentially private. Praying is something that's just between me and God. But if prayer is something that's just between an individual and God, then why were these words written down in John chapter 17? It's because prayers are meant to be shared. And because in the sharing, I believe you and I find hope. I'm sure that there's a lot of people who pray for me. But what really encourages me is when people tell me they're praying for me, right? Sometimes... Folks will say, Pastor, I'm praying for you, to which I always say, good, I need it. And that sounds like a joke, but it's not. I need it. I need prayer. And it's wonderful that people pray for me, but it's even better when people tell me because then I am encouraged by that. I find strength in that. Does that make sense? Part of the power of prayer is not 
that we're trying to change God's mind to do what we want as we mistakenly believe. The power of prayer is that we are expressing compassion and solidarity. It is a way that we are showing how we take care of each other. And that's why I love this prayer of Jesus on behalf of his followers. Whether or not the prayer is ever answered is almost beside the point. This is a sign of how much Jesus loves us. And we can accept it gratefully as such. So what does Jesus pray for us, for his followers? A couple of things I see here. Number one, Jesus prays for our protection. Jesus says we belong to him, and that is an identity that nothing can change. I think that's a promise we're celebrating this morning. But Jesus also says that because we belong to him, we're going to find ourselves battling with the forces of this world. And whether we call that sin, whether we call that Satan, whether we call it the evil one, as Jesus does in this passage, it is clear that we are going to face some opposition as we attempt to live faithfully. Peace, forgiveness, the cancellation of debts, the release of the captives. This is the mission of Christ, and by extension, the mission of the church. But I don't have to tell you that there are a lot of forces in this world that are arrayed against that good news. There are a lot of folks who profit off of war, off of division, off of debt. And so Jesus, instead of painting this rosy, unrealistic picture for us, gives it to us straight in this prayer. Jesus wants us, his followers, to go into the future wide-eyed, about what we are going to encounter. There's going to be resistance. And it is interesting to me that Jesus does not pray for the prevention of that resistance. But he does pray that there will be protection when it comes. That's what I think you and I cling to this morning. When we face the reality of a world that is hostile to Jesus, we seek refuge in him. Sometimes I know uh, good Christians, church folks, who are facing difficulties, and they say, why is this happening to me, Lord? That is not a question that Jesus addresses in this prayer. Instead, Jesus shifts the why to the how. How do we deal with what has happened to us? And the answer is, we rely on him. That is still a part of our mission as the church in the year 2021. We're not always going to avoid persecution, but we are promised protection when that occurs. And that's spelled out in verse 11. Jesus prays, Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. So why are we being protected? That we may be one. The purpose of our protection is not to be inoculated from pain because we're going to experience that no matter what. The purpose of our protection is to be united. You know, I find it frustrating sometimes that we spend so much time and energy in the American church of the 21st century fussing about and opposing all these perceived cultural threats. Oh! The... The loss of morality is destroying the church. A lack of prayer in schools is destroying the church. People who don't come to church are destroying the church. And you and I go down the list of all these different issues because it's nice to have someone to blame. Convenient scapegoats. Certainly there's a lot of factors that contribute to the decline of the church today, but instead of worrying so much about all those external threats, maybe we turn the mirror back on ourselves because I really think sometimes we are our own worst enemy. I think the brokenness that exists in our church distorts our mission just as much as a lot of those supposed cultural threats. You and I don't have to go outside the walls of this church to find anger and strife and pettiness. We got plenty of it right here. People who keep in score about what I said back in 2013, what I didn't do, what you didn't do, what you did do, what you said. 
judging you, judging me, whether they even know what the real situation was. And it, it's destructive. A couple of weeks ago, my family and I, we went up to Philadelphia for a few days for spring break. And while we were there, we went to a Phillies baseball game. I've been to many professional sporting events over the years, but never have been to a game in Philadelphia. And so I got a firsthand taste of what the fans are like there. Uh, passionate is one way to describe it. Rude to the point of obnoxiousness is a more accurate way to describe it. Before the game even started, when the announcer was introducing the uh, other team, the Mets, one by one, the, the people were already booing every single time somebody new got announced. And uh, that just increased as the game went on. Of course, every now and then they would shift from booze to screaming obscenities just in case you weren't getting the full picture. But you know, the game progressed, the beer flowed. By the fifth inning, the Phillies were losing to the Mets, and so folks started booing them. I, I mean, I'd, I'd never seen anything like it. I've heard of booing the other guys, that's bad enough, but these Folks were booing their own team, screaming, heckling. You know, I guess maybe that's just what it means to be a, a sports fan in Philly. But what I thought to myself is, this is what it's like in the church. We got enough people booing us already. We don't need to boo ourselves if we are tearing each other down. If we are griping, if we are complaining, if we are gossiping about each other, we don't stand a chance. Now, sure, we got lots of problems, lots of threats from out there in the world that are against us. But let's be honest that a lot of the damage that happens in the church is self-inflicted. And this prayer, this prayer is calling us to end that behavior. This prayer is calling us to be one. That doesn't mean we're always going to agree, but it does mean we're going to be our own cheerleaders. We're going to uplift. We're going to find ways to encourage because Talbot Park is only going to be as strong as our relationships with each other. Here's another profound thing that Jesus says in this prayer, that our unity in some mysterious way reflects the unity between the Father and the Son. That's a deep thought, isn't it? And, and very overwhelming. But it gets right at the heart of who we are as God's people. That others come to know the love of Jesus by looking at how we love each other. So that getting along, being united, is more than just uh, for our congregational happiness. It's our witness to the world. And Jesus knows that's going to be tough. <laughs> so he prays for us to be protected so that we will be one as he and the Father are one. The church, our church, is a wonderful group of people. I love the bond we have here at Talbot Park. But the church at its best is never just about what we are getting out of it. It's about how we are being formed into new people and that's the other thing that Jesus prays here in John chapter 17. He prays that we will be sanctified in the truth. Sanctification is a big church word we never use. That just means to be set apart. And that is still part of our calling as Talbot Park in the year 2021. I know sometimes it's easy to get discouraged we look around, we see fewer people in the pews, we see older people in the pews, we compare our present to our past, and we say, oh, how far we've fallen. And then we look up here at the pulpit, we see who's preaching, and we think, oh, we've hit the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> see, y'all tell me you're praying for me, but what you don't say out loud is you're praying that I'll be a better preacher. I know that anyway, you don't have to say it. And I hope that prayer is answered just as much as you do. But, but, and... I have said this before, it's worth repeating on the 78th anniversary Sunday, you and I are focused on the wrong metrics. Our success is not defined by how many people are in the pews. It's not defined by how much money is in the offering plate. It's not even defined by whether we keep the doors open, as you heard me say last week. 
Our success as a congregation is the degree to which we are being sanctified in the truth. That's it. All those other things are important, but sanctification is our best measure of success. That's how I assess us. Are we becoming more like Christ? Doesn't mean we're perfect. We had not got there yet. All make mistakes. But are we more loving, more compassionate, willing to serve, open to the movement of the Holy Spirit? Because that is what matters. That is what Jesus is asking for us in this prayer. He doesn't pray for us to grow numerically. He doesn't pray for us to keep the doors open. He prays for us to be set apart. What does that look like, to be set apart? Well, I think it means that we as Talbot Park offer a real alternative to the world. As someone who grew up in Georgia, I am obviously a big fan of Coca-Cola. Pepsi, to me, is just the watered-down alternative, and I know we have some Pepsi fans in our midst. All I can say is Pepsi is what you drink when Coke isn't available. Uh, when we go out to eat with my mom, uh, when she orders a Coke and they tell her we have Pepsi, she said, no, thank you. She wants the real thing. I don't blame her. People want the real thing. That's how we all are. And unfortunately, our, our church has been kind of offering a watered-down version of the world for quite a while now. So when folks say, well, what's church about? We say, well, I, I like to go there, be around my friends. And I like to go there because there's people who like me. And I like to sing. And the preacher's cute. You and I list a lot of reasons for participating in church, and some of them are even good reasons, but there is only one compelling thing that makes the church different, and that is Jesus. Jesus is who gathers us together. Jesus is who sets us apart. The church is never going to succeed if we're trying to be the Pepsi of the world We've got to offer the real thing. We've got to be sanctified so that people will see that Jesus is at the center of our lives together. And when we do that, here's some good news. We find our fulfillment in life. In this prayer, Jesus says he is saying these things to us so that our joy may be complete. So on this anniversary Sunday of Talbot Park, may we be one as we give thanks to Jesus the Christ who sets us apart and brings us joy. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. God, we love this story of Pentecost because it reminds us of ourselves. We come gathered from all places, all backgrounds. Some of us more eager to be here than others, some with hidden hurts, many of us who have found the church to be disappointing at times, many of us who grow discouraged because things do not always reflect the joy we wish to see in this world and even in our lives together. And then we hear of your Holy Spirit, which comes, which breaks through like a rushing wind among people who are divided, among people who can't even communicate with each other because they're so different. And because of you, because of that Spirit, what is broken is brought together again. Now, we're never going to be united because we agree on the issues. We're only going to be united in the truth of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we are so grateful this morning for the joy and the love that he continues to show us, for the grace that we have received as his people, for the grace we continue to receive as his people, for the grace we're going to receive as his people. Because we believe that this prayer of Jesus is not the only time that Jesus has prayed on our behalf. We believe even now Jesus intercedes at the right hand of the Father for us, that Jesus continues to pray for our protection, for our sanctification, for our unity. Lord, we need those prayers, and we are grateful to know that they are being offered for us. 
in his name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together, Standing on the Promises.
I hope you can say after you leave here today that you didn't just come to church, but you've been to church. You know the difference? Amen. It's so good to look out and see so many of you here and so many that I haven't seen in a long time. It's good to see the faces again and for us to be present in this place. Uh, good news. The fun isn't over yet. We get to continue our time of fellowship and everybody here is invited. Wait a minute, I didn't make an RSVP. It's okay because we have a gracious God. You didn't have to make an RSVP. We got free lunch waiting for you. You just go right through these doors and there's a box lunch for Pollard's you can pick up and a drink and uh, there's a few tables sitting inside. There's a few outside. If you brought a chair, that'd be great. We're gonna gather around the magnolia trees out here and uh, fellowship until we can't take it anymore. So. Uh, <laughs> If you want to drop some uh, money in the basket on your way in as a donation, that's fine, but there's no charge. So just uh, enjoy ourselves uh, this afternoon as we continue to celebrate our anniversary in this life together. Uh, reminder, we're collecting for the anniversary offering, and this is a designated offering that we collect uh, every year. This year, it's going to uh, supply a technology intern going to help us do some new things with the website and uh, our technology virtual stuff since we're into that now uh, and uh, maybe give us some pointers and help on that so we're looking forward to that 10 percent of what we collect we're going to give back to the food bank uh, as we consider the needs of those in the community so those envelopes were in your boxes if you didn't have an envelope you can just designate that on your check and drop that in the plate and the plates today There'll be one in the back if you're going out that door. There'll be one right here uh, in front of the flag if you're going out this door to head to the fellowship hall, which I hope you are. And now let's stand together as we sing our benediction for Pentecost, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. <laughs> 